Okay, we're continuing our discussion of communication, crisis problems in the healthcare uh, context. Our guest this evening is Chuck Edmonds, who has his own healthcare uh, consulting company. Do we have questions from class that we merge? Lara. But I work with someone um, whose daughter was giving birth and they found out she had TB. So they tested him and he, his skin graft came back positive, but they did x-rays of his lungs and that came back negative. So after a week of um, time off, he came back to work. But at that time, I was very sick and it scared me to death because we pass each other. And I, I mean, I hear rumors, you can die from TB, you catch it from walking by someone, that there's flare-ups everywhere. And it just panicked me to death that I got a test which came back negative, but I'm thinking, how serious is the new outbreak of TB and should people like me be worried because I work with someone whose daughter who has it? Well, uh, the TB test that, that is given and now, it, it's, it's much better than no test at all, but the reality is once you've ever been exposed to it, it, it can frequently turn up positive. Um, every time I take a TB test, I come back with a, with a raging cage of, case of TB uh, just because I've been exposed to it once. But if, in, in fact, that individual had had his uh, lung uh, chest x-ray and it was clear, then he's fine. And so um, I don't think you need to worry about it too much. Now, the issue not only with, with TB, but the whole issue of, of immunization is, is an area that we need to continue to work on um, as a society. Uh, it's, it is sad to me, worse than sad, that we have the technology and we have the ability to, to uh, essentially um, eliminate a lot of the uh, diseases that have, for over the course of you know, hundreds of thousands of years, have run, raised havoc with our society and with mankind, and we just simply, through neglect, don't choose to get those uh, childhood immunizations uh, in place. So there's a cure? for TB? I don't know. <laughs> I'm not a physician. I don't know that there's a cure. I think that they can do uh, uh, a lot with you and, and you can... Uh, but they can control the spread control of it, it. Yeah, is and, and, the important yeah. part of it and they can test for it to determine who does. And, who and they can that. treat you so that you, you know, I don't know that there is a, is a cure. I'm, I'm simply not... Uh, uh, it seems area. like it, it's more like it goes into remission. I think they can, yeah. I it think it they never can. goes away. It's like hepatitis and some of the, the problem never completely goes away, but it becomes manageable and non-contagious. Right. right. I think. Nancy. There's been a lot of talk last two or three years about the health care crisis in the United States. And, I, you know, I hate to be insensitive to people that... Uh, you know, may not have the proper health care or the one that they desire, but is not the health care in the United States about the best in the world? And, you know, when they're talking about crisis, I mean, do you think the government is able to take care of, of something that seems to be working pretty well privatized? Do you want to answer that question? <laughs> <laughs> or just take the part that you like. Well... <laughs> Uh, number one, I, I don't think there's any question at all that the uh, health care in the United States uh, is, is better than any place else in the entire world. Now, you read all the studies and you see that in the industrialized nations, the United States ranks 18th, I think, among um, numbers of, of uh, live births and whatever that is, and that Sweden's got this better deal and we ought to all go move to Sweden and so on. Um, but the reality is American industry has been the, the research pipeline for the vast majority of the advances that we've seen in health care, uh, certainly in this century. Um, the health care crisis is an interesting term because what we're really talking about is cost. Okay, and if we look at cost, um, there's a number of things that we can do about that. If you, <clears throat> if you go back in this country, and well, we'll, we'll back up even further. Uh, I, I recently had to give a little talk and, and uh, looked at, at uh, 
health insurance and the history of health insurance. And, and I came across what I believe to be one of the first health insurance policies ever. It turns out that in about 300 BC in Greece, it was a real simple program. If the patient was healthy, the doctor got paid. If the patient got sick, the doctor didn't get paid. And if the patient died, we needed a new doctor. So there are certain like parts that, of that yeah. that we might be able to translate until today. I also ran across in looking at that, the fact that from about 100 BC until 1900, for that 2000 year period, our life expectancy as a race was about 35 years, period. And from 1900 to 1940, we were able to increase that by 14 years. And that was due primarily to sanitation, personal hygiene, issues like that. And from 1940 till today, we've added another 16 years, and that's been due to immunizations and, and those kinds of programs and, and the advances we've made in technology. If you look at healthcare delivery, and when we talk about a healthcare crisis or healthcare reform, those kinds of things, you look at the whole thing, and, and in fact, 1929 in, in Dallas, a group of teachers got together. And just by the way, teachers are the biggest users of health care services of any other group in the entire country. But, but we're very healthy. Well, you are healthy, but you also know how to use the system. <laughs> but um, a group of teachers got together and said, gee, we're all, you know, basically same sex, same this, same that, have the same needs for our children and so on and so forth and let's begin to put together some money so that if one of us gets sick we can have some money to help do it. Well, it, that was the beginnings of Blue Cross Blue Shield program in Texas which then went to other states and so on and, and Blue Cross is one of the largest uh, indemnity carriers in the country and has been around for a long time. Um, and if you look then at what happened with the delivery of care uh, in, in 1941, obviously, was the war. Well, in, in World War II, we, we, as a nation, we began to, you know, we poured all of our resources into fighting the war. And so you had the stories of Ruby the Riveter. And you had pit situations where, where you had people that were not necessarily a, naturally in, inclined to be involved in a certain kind of, uh, of vocation suddenly had to do things. Well, they did a good job. And yet, the, our assets, our monetary assets, were basically frozen. So we couldn't give, you know, Susie a raise because she did a good job, you know, bolting that battleship together. So we had to find other ways as a nation to begin to give non-monetary incentives or, or validation to the fact that this individual was working hard for us. And so the whole issue of benefits and health benefits basically grew up and, and became uh, a part of, of, the, of the total reimbursement system during World War II so that we had a brand new idea called uh, well, paid vacations and sick leave. Those were issues that were just totally unheard of and it was really, this is the 60th year of Social Security so even that concept is really not that old. Well you came through World War II and prior to World War II more people died from uh, wounds and, and, and complications from wounds in all the wars we ever had than they did from directly being killed. You know, I shot him and hit him right between the eyes and killed him. No, what I probably did was I shot at him, tried to hit him between the eyes, and I probably hit him in the foot and the infection killed him. And so uh, it was just during World War II that we began to the concepts of med mobile hospitals and, and uh, in fact, uh, evacuation to getting them off the front lines and getting them treated early on and, and uh, trying to save limbs and so on. And out of World War II came the whole business of the VA hospital system. And so the whole concept of healthcare changed. Dr. Richard Winerdy, who's the president of the Texas Medical Center, likes to give a lot of talks. And one of the things that he gives, uh, he says, is that um, if you were able today to control uh, tobacco, drug and alcohol abuse and promiscuity, you could take 30 to 40 percent of the total cost of health care out of the equation. And if you stop and think about that, the tobacco use and all the, the long-term care that's required because of the lung 
cancers and all of those issues, the drug and alcohol business and just the violence associated with that, not to say anything about the users, but just this, the Friday night specials and all that sort of thing, you begin to think that, that he probably has a pretty good a pretty good point. A lot of the cost of care is associated with some relatively simple societal issues. But if we go back and kind of track back through, we got through World War II and what was going on with our expectations, we could do, we could do better. So we ought to do better and we ought to, you know. Um, in, in the 50s, uh, we again we had a Korean conflict and we learned a lot about wound management and a lot about trauma and a lot about how to take care of the acutely ill. But it was 1948 when Dr. John Drew uh, discovered blood types. Okay, that's a relatively new thing, and and now the whole industry that's grown up around blood typing and and what we can do and how to take care of patients and and their expectation that they're going to do better. I worked at the Heart Institute long enough that when I started there in the early 70s, basically we didn't do open heart surgery on people that were in their mid to late 60s, not because we didn't technically know what to do, but we couldn't be assured that we could wake you up and that you'd be the same person after that you'd been through the experience that you were before. Today, uh, we have no reason at all not to go ahead and put a, a valve in an 85-year-old and expect him to do very, very well for the next 15 to 20 years. So a lot of little things have happened and changed and we've gotten a lot better at a lot of things um, through experience and, and just through advances of the technologies and the, and the experiments. You, you asked a question earlier on <coughs> about excess capacity and streamlining things and there is a very large move afoot right now um, <coughs> to, uh, to streamline medicine and, and it's, it's basically cost driven. Um, but I think we will all uh, be victims, if you will, or we will all suffer if your children and your children's children are treated by 1995 technology. So that as we go through and we streamline things and we bring this, the excess capacity out of the system, I hope we don't lose sight of the fact that we've got to keep the educational piece and the research piece as part of that equation. Right now, I think the pendulum's swinging back, you know, towards let's get the fat out. I hope we just don't lose sight of how far that pendulum's going to swing. Um, but as, as you go along and you look back and we talk about uh, this whole business of, of health care crisis and, and we look and see why, why we have this crisis or if in fact it is a crisis, um, you got through the 50s and, and you found uh, there was a, a bill passed, a federal bill passed in the late 40s called the Hill-Burton Act. And that act basically said we'll take federal money and build hospitals bricks and mortar in communities so uh, and those those were great sorts of things to have and they were tremendous uh, sources of pride for communities because you know you may beat me in football but you're not going to beat me in hospital and uh, and that's good except that because you had to have something you know we talked before about we'll take a doctor from anywhere because we have to have a doctor um, but does does Houston Texas need uh, 75 hospitals or whatever we have now do we have we have 6,000 inpatient hospital beds in the medical center um, where does it start and where does it stop the anymore? AIDS hospital went under it went under and is that a cost thing or well I think factors? it was I think there there were a number of factors there Dr. Hahn one of them was and we continue to see this the stigma associated with that particular disease I think as a society, we're learning more, and we're much more accepting in 1995 than we were in 1991 um, about that disease. Uh, but we as a society need to find ways to come to grips with that disease because those patients, as they progress, <clears throat> that's multiple, multiple organ failure and incredibly acutely ill patients that we just can consume just enormous amounts of, res of resources. And where are we? Those patients, and those health care providers are, they take an oath to do everything they can to save this patient. Well, if in fact there is no known cure, and you know that and I know that, how much resource are we going to pour into this individual trying to sustain life when we know that we're not going to get there? And, and you see this incredible increase in resource utilization very near the end of their life. Where do we do that versus going ahead and giving them 
enough morphine to keep them comfortable and let them fade. I, and I'm not going to get into those kinds of ethical questions. It's way beyond my scope. But they're issues that, as a society, we need to begin to think about. If you go back, and I, I promise to stop in just a second, but you go on, go on through and you look in 1965 with, with Medicare. Finally, the government said, okay, now I'm going to get involved with, you know, taking, and there's nothing wrong with Medicare. Medicare was a great idea, and it's, it's fantastic that as a society we found it appropriate to go ahead and provide minimal care and, and, and so on for the, the indigent people in, the, in this country. Um, but the, what that did was it set the, the federal government up as the largest purchaser of health services in the country. And now, if you look at it, they're buying, you know, 60% of all the health care dollars are being purchased by the, by the federal government. And so um, it, uh, it gets to be very, very expensive on their part. Now it's a crisis because they're having to foot the bill. So you saw in 1983 where they came back, they changed the, the way that they reimbursed people. Before, they basically said they ran it more or less like indemnity. And indemnity health care says... You can go anywhere you want to go, and I'll pay 80%, and you'll pay 20%. Well, they simply couldn't afford that. So they began to, to limit your choices to say you've got to go within, you know, you can go anywhere you want to within this network or anywhere you want to go to within certain con, uh, constraints. And what the government did in 1983 was they started a new program, or they changed the Medicare reimbursement program to a program called uh, diagnostic related groups or DRGs and basically they said all right we'll pay you X number of dollars to treat this patient in Y number of days and if you can do it for less than that you can keep the money but if it costs you more than that sorry that's all we're going to give you unless the patient gets real sick and goes way out here then we'll look at, at what they call an outlier and give you some more money <coughs> but they had to put some limits on it and even with that uh, and as we've evolved and gone on uh, in industry today and, and just across the board, people's uh, premiums are going up still at double-digit inflation numbers every year. If I cost you $100 per employee this year, it's probably going to cost you about 110 next year. And you simply are getting to the point as, as communications um, improve and we don't have a a society that necessarily says my competitor is down the road, uh, he's not even not only down the road, he's not even in Dallas, he's not even in Texas. Now I'm competing with the European market and the, and the Pacific Rim markets and so on. I've got to find ways to keep all of my costs in place and keep, you know, I can't con continue to pay uh, 12, 14, 15 percent increases for one uh, component of, of my overall expenses, so I've got to find a way to get my arms around that. And that is essentially where the crisis side of the thing comes into place. Okay? Carol. Well, and relative to cost, I'm, I'm curious because um, two things. One, one is I can see where in some ways we are better served that even in, in countries, the model that so often we heard talked about was that, um, say, Canada, Mm -hmm. Where everyone gets treated, you mm -hmm. know, it, it, you're guaranteed if you're a citizen, you know, you're mm -hmm. going to get treated, doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. But of course, I have friends who are Canadian citizens who said, who are living here, and who said, you know, and she's working here and, and, and had some problems and had to go in for some knee surgery or whatever. And, you know, from the time the doctor determined that's what needed to be done, within two weeks she was getting treated. And she said she was talking to her relatives at home in Canada, and they were amazed to hear how soon she was getting treated, because in Canada everyone gets it, but you go on a waiting list, and, and you might be a couple of years before your little knee problem gets taken care of, and meanwhile you get to hobble around and take pain pills. Right. But the, but the flip side of that is, having worked, spent all this time working with some of these um, indemnity and, and HMO and some of the other things, I've looked at a lot of records um, and, all, and every time I saw a hospital bill get audited, which I, I don't know what, how that system works of when they choose to, mm -hmm. but every single time I saw an, a hospital bill get audited, the, uh, the hospital ended up eating some cost because they couldn't, you know. That's, and that's a documentation problem. Was that, a, was, do you and think so, as, sure. opposed, as opposed to, I mean, you know, because you, you, after a while you started developing the impression of the hospitals are padding the bill. So what well, starts they to are. look like? They are. I mean, that, that gets you into... Uh, situation called, uh, you know, sometimes you get into cost shifting where um, 
if this is an HMO patient and I have a contract that I can only charge you so many dollars per day for a medical surgical bed uh, and, I, and I have this indemnity patient over here where it's 80% of bill charges, I'm going to shuffle my, my charges over there in that direction and let him pay for it because I have a certain amount of cost. Um, I, I may not overtly do that, but I do that. But most of the time, if you're going to look at an audited bill, when, a, when a, a, an individual bill gets audited and there's this problem and the hospital, as you said, eats the cost, almost always that's a, that's a documentation problem where they did not show, you know, go all the way back in the nurse's notes and it says, and the patient should have this treatment or the patient should take these pills or whatever. And so then the, the auditor comes in and says, well, here's this, you know, this particular charge for this particular treatment or this particular pill, show me where it was ordered. And if you can't tie those together, then the hospital's going to say, fine, we'll just take that off the bill. But that's more, again, again that's a documentation issue. Uh, your other issue about the Canadian system or the English system or whatever, most of the time in most of the nationalized healthcare delivery systems, the problem that you have is, you know, is the waiting. Um, yes, it only costs a certain amount of money, but sooner or later those dollars have got to be paid for by somebody. And so, you know, if you're going to deliver the, the caliber of care that, that you've grown accustomed to, and that was what I was trying to get at when I talked a minute ago, is as a society we've grown up with the very finest uh, health care available is, is now an inalienable right. Well, is it really? I mean, you know, part of our problem is we cannot, I saw a little saying, and I apologize for not bringing that with me tonight, but I thought it was kind of cute. It said, you can't eat a high-fat, low-fiber diet, smoke cigarettes, practice unsafe sex, not wear your seat belt, and say, it's okay, uh, I take vitamin E and society owes me the best care available. <laughs> Somehow you've got to be responsible for part of what you're involved in here. And the cost of that. And, and so we throw a lot of things into the growing cost and the crisis of, of the cost side of the equation that are really societal issues. Uh, let's go back to Alice and then we'll come up. I was just going to say, is that the reason why things like aspirin costs so much in the hospitals and that a box of tissues is like $12. Yeah. I mean, I always wondered why it was so expensive yeah. because then the patients just would rather go out and have their family buy it, bring it in, and have the nurses stop. Right. Mm. No, that's exactly right. All the hospitals have a little, what they call welcome kits or whatever that have tissues and da-da-da-da-da-da. And, and those things, if you were to take it apart and go down to the Eckert's or Walgreens or wherever and buy, buy them item by item, it wouldn't cost anywhere near that. And they've, but we get back and part of this, you throw it off on the hospital and, <clears throat> and yet hospitals, because of the way hospitals evolved and healthcare evolved, and we talked about that a while ago, quite honestly, um, I can't say, I've got a number of hospital clients and I don't know very many of them who really and truly know what their costs are. They don't, <clears throat> they don't think about that. They're a lot better now, significantly better now than they used to be. But they're not particularly good at knowing what their costs are and what it, what does it actually cost them to do that. Physicians aren't any better. What does it actually cost you to set that broken arm? I don't know. I just do it and so on and so forth. Is there too much happening too fast? Or well, it's just, it's just been, it's just been, you know, people didn't get paid. The people that went into, medical, into medicine for a lot of years didn't go into it to get rich. I mean, they got rich, some of them, and, and that was great. But if you go back two generations, those guys weren't getting rich. Those guys were there to take care of patients. And with the advent of, of insurance, and they all bellyache about insurance, but son of, a, son of a gun, now all of a sudden I've got a, a reasonable source of, of having an expectation of getting them paid something for that care. I mean, I used to get paid in, in chickens or cords of wood or dozens of eggs or whatever it was, or not paid at all in the goodwill of the guy that I took care of. And I used to take care of that entire family. I'd take, you know, I'd, from the time he was born until his grandpa died, I did everything there was to do for that family. Well, technology's changed and things have changed, but it's cost a lot of money. 
And there's fraud in, in every situation, no more so in medicine than in any other industry, but there is the issue of fraud. There are the issues of situations where, where uh, you know, people and, and, and certain folks will take advantage of situations. But uh, by and large, uh, it's not, you know, it, it's certainly not uh, rampant by any stretch of the imagination. But it exists. Yes, ma'am brought up, um, you made me remember it when I was a child, I'm going to age myself, but we did have a family physician who would actually come to our home and mm -hmm. he gave us little lollipops on, on <laughs> loop. They, they weren't on a stick, they had a loop and, and g remember gave us those? our shots right in our bed. and uh, Did the stitches at home. Yeah, the good old Dr. Ward. He, right. he ended up committing suicide in, in the neighborhood one evening. He had gotten home from taking care of one of the neighbors and went home and OD'd. But anyway, my question is, do you see a return to the family physician? I, I've heard some discussion about that, and, and it seems, I don't know where I stand on the issue. I know I, my, I took my son to the pediatrician because he was complaining a lot about pain in his heels, and he actually started walking on the, the, the ball of his foot and it started to worry me too much. After I put it off for about a year, I said, okay, we have to take a, take a look at this. And the pediatrician ended up sending us to a knee and foot specialist or something. And I just, I, it was just astronomical what that guy charged us. It was incredible. And he started off by taking an x-ray of his knee instead of his foot. Well, I think there are. Uh, that's a, that's an incredibly complex kind of an issue. The federal government has now begun to force more medical schools to train more family practitioners. Okay, they've done it by changing the allocations of the medical schools, and they've also done it by restricting and reducing the number of training positions and specialties. Um, a year ago, 13 months ago, whatever, uh, last spring, uh, the American College of Urology, have, they have a meeting, all the societies for the specialists have meetings all the time, and that particular meeting was held in Sacramento, California. And the president of the American College of Urology was the keynote speaker, and he got up and he said, Ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased that you're here, and so on and so forth. He said, but the first thing I want to tell you is that as of this morning, 30% of the practicing urologists in the state of California in 1993 are no longer practicing urology in California today in 1994. There simply aren't enough patience for them to continue to do what they're doing. So you're beginning to see that sort of thing, and we, we've got to come to grips with the fact that now we have two and a half times the number of physicians per 100,000 population that we had just 20, 25 years ago. We've got to come to grips with those kinds of issues. Do we have enough family practitioners? No. Right now, are they in incredible demand? Yeah. A Methodist Hospital and Herman Hospital and Memorial Hospital, all these guys are going out spending incredible amounts of money trying to entice them and induce them into doing things to admit to their hospitals. Um, and and it's, it is, it's part of a continuum of care. You've got to find ways to do that. But we, again, and it's all interrelated because um, if I'm smart enough to go to medical school and I have a choice between seeing, you know, 65 patients a day in my clinic uh, running them through fast as I can and having an overhead of 60 percent versus going by and having, you know, 10 patients a day and making lots more money, uh, you know, I'm a human. What, which way am I going to go if I have the choice? And it's, you know, I'm still taking care of patients. I'm still doing what I want to do. It's a hard, hard thing to do, and it's hard to get your arms around. Uh, will we see more family practitioners? Yeah. Will we get back to the situation where, where you grew up and he actually came to your house? Uh, in urban areas, I doubt it. In, in, in areas uh, less mobile than, than Houston, probably. Um, I'll finish that little question with a, 
was a quick story that uh, my boys are 12 and 14 years old, and uh, we were, we'd been married for eight or 10 years or so before we got around to having kids. And so my wife being the school teacher that she is, she goes out and she asks everybody all these questions. And we went and interviewed three or four pediatricians, see who we were going to go to see for our, you know, this kid. I did that too. Maybe it's a oh, school teacher a thing. school yeah. teacher thing. Anyway, yeah, we went to see a, a gentleman who was uh, quite probably in his late 50s or early 60s. And as we talked, and I, I just struck me, I said to him, I said, well, what, what difference, what do you see different in patients today, in your, med in your practice today, than you did 15 years ago? And he said, oh, he says, that's an easy answer. He says, I, I treat a lot of mother-in-law disease. And I <laughs> said, what do you mean mother-in-law disease? And he looked at my wife and he said, how far is it from your house to your mother's house? And she said, about 800 miles. And, she, and he looks at me and he said, and how far is it from your house to your mother's house? And I said, add another 800 miles. And he said, see what I mean? He said, Houston is such a mobile society and there's been such an influx of people that what used to be simple, he said, you two are well-educated people and you're terribly concerned about the welfare of this baby. And there's gonna be a day when that baby's not gonna go down like he ought to go down. He's going to cry and he's going to whimper and you're not going to know what to do. And he said, in the old days, your aunt lived next door, your cousin lived down the street, you'd taken care of all these other little kids. You knew what to do. He said, but now you don't know what to do. You read the book, you can't find it. Baby is supposed to stop crying. So he said, what do you do? He called me. He says, I don't mind. But he said, that's what it is. It's mother-in-law disease because she's not there to treat, to take care of. And you don't see in a society like Houston's, the, you know, that extended family, that that situation where he would make the rounds through the neighborhood. He just simply can't make the rounds through the neighborhood. Yes, okay. ma'am. You've kind of tested some things that, that have um, lead to a question that I've been curious about. I'm working in the medical center right now, and um, I'm at, um, interacting through Methodists and stuff, and I hear that, I was hearing from people and staff and staff members that I'm interacting with, they had some big layoffs probably in the last year. Uh -huh. and, I, and I've had other friends who were at other hospitals, there were a lot of layoffs and stuff, and yet, so presumably they had excess capacity. Uh -huh. And yet, as I'm driving th into work every day, I am driving past two or three more hospitals under construction, and I'm kind of going, I don't understand. <laughs> well, again, these are, are interesting questions and they're not simple. Um, Healthcare hospitals are, are under, it's, it's an interesting industry. Um, we go back to the, what we said before. You know, you may beat me in football, but you're not going to beat me in hospital. There's an incredible amount of pride in facilities, okay? Hospitals as an industry are kind of unique in that, gee, uh, our census isn't what it ought to be, so let's add a new cancer wing. I mean, how many other industries, if you're not, you know, if you're having trouble meeting the payroll or you don't have the volume you need, do you go out and expand? Hospitals in a, as an industry tend to do that. Doesn't make a lot of sense, but they tend to. Well, they're supposed to draw more patients. Right, to, to be able to go out and, and we'll become a more of a full service bank. Okay, as an industry, hospitals are going to have to come to grips with the fact that we don't need 31 hospitals in Harris County that, that attest to having a cancer unit. Okay, we do. If you get on the phone and call them, you'll find the uh, last time I did, but it was a couple of years ago, oh yeah, we've got a cancer unit here. It may be an oncologist that comes by on Thursday mornings. But from a you know, from a PR perspective, come to our hospital because we do this and that and the other thing. You have six thousand inpatient beds in the medical center. The Methodist Hospital, when they finished their construction in the late nineteen eighties, largest uh, private hospital in the nation. Texas, Texas Children's is the largest uh, children's hospital in the nation, okay? St. Luke's Episcopal Hospital, 954 beds or something like that, okay? Licensed beds. Well, <clears throat> what was going on in the medical center, and the medical center is, a, is an interesting thing that's not necessarily true for other places, but because Dr. DeBakey was Dr. DeBakey, 
because Dr. Cooley was Dr. Cooley, because Dr. Clark was who he was at MD Anderson. You had, you had technologies that, that were expanding and you had individuals who embraced those technologies or who personified those technologies who were terribly, terribly capable individuals as, as individuals. In 1975, the Methodist Hospital and St. Luke's Hospital collectively did f just over 5,000 open heart surgeries. That was 10% of the open hearts done in the entire United States in 1975. Today, those programs continue to be large programs, but now instead of 50,000 open hearts done in, in this country, we do close to 300,000 open hearts in this country. And I come back to you again. Are we six times sicker in 1995 than we were in 1975? One has to wonder about, is, is this an inalienable right? Do you need to have you know, a zipper right here that says, look here, I've, I've had my bypass surgery. Why is it that we're doing some of the things that we're doing? And part of the reason, and you can throw rocks at the hospital or the doctors, but it's demand-driven economy, you know, and, and economics, and, and one side pushes the other. And we've got to, as a society, begin to say, where, when is enough enough? Um, we've got overcapacity, there's no question about it. But you go back to the medical center, for many, many, many years, um, the patient mix, if you will, ran something like this. A third of the patients that came to the medical center were from around the world, literally. A third of the patients that came to the medical center were from across the nation. And a third of the patients were Texans. Not necessarily even Houstonians, but Texans. Okay? So Texas Medical Center probably did a class, classic textbook job of not marketing to Houston. You couldn't find the place. You can't park. It's not easy access off of any freeways. You, can, you go down there and you try to park. You can't find it. You get in the building, you get lost. Okay. But they didn't need to worry about that because they were so busy just trying to take care of the here and now. You can't really throw rocks at them. Now, though, you look at what's going on and you're right. There are hospitals under construction on the way to your job. If you come straight up Maine from, from South Maine, you go right past the new... Um, Columbia Orthopedic Hospital, which is a fine facility, and the new Shriners Hospital. Well, the Shriner Hospital is a replacement facility for the facility that was in between Ben Taub and um, the, where did it set over there? Rehab? Yeah, and the old TIRR. Okay, and so that's kind of a replacement facility that really got tucked away. And With the Orthopedic Hospital, and you come back to this, Columbia HCA, which is the largest now owner of hospital beds of any, anybody in the nation. It's, it's an industry. And you can't lose sight as we go through all of this, when we talk about the communication piece or the cost piece or anything that you want to talk about. It's an industry. And the business of medicine is an area that the providers of medicine haven't spent the time in studying that they need to and that, they, that they'll have to. And we go back and we, they've spent all those years looking at the science of it and the art of it, but not so much about the business of it, and they're having to do that. Now, there are a lot of people out there who think the, you know, Columbia, and Wall Street loves Columbia HCA. They think those guys are wonderful, and they may be. They own 19 hospitals in Houston, Texas. Um, somehow, sooner or later, they're going to have to service that debt. Okay? They're, I wouldn't profess, profess to be... Uh, brilliant enough to tell you how they do it. In fact, I've done some work for them and I enjoy them as a client. But I don't want to have to service that debt. I hope they know something I don't know about what's going to happen sooner or later. How do you continue to buy those things and build those things and where do those patients come from? Because we really only have now about 3.4 million people in Houston and we're collectively through all those hospitals going to have to find ways to take care of those patients. I worked at the Heart Institute in St. Luke's and Texas Children's long enough to remember when we li had patients literally from around the world. At one time we had a thing called the Dutch Air Bridge where we brought literally 30 patients at a time from the Netherlands. And they'd come and they'd have their heart uh, treatments taken care of and they'd go back and here'd come another uh, airplane load of, of patients. And, and we've, we've been involved with managed care there long enough that we had, for many years, we had patients that came out of New Jersey, New York, patients that came <coughs> routinely came out of 
Central and South Florida. But a lot of that stuff is, you know, has gone by the boards in large measure because you have expertise in Central and South Florida that's every bit as capable and, and able as the, as the patients and the, as the physicians that are here in the medical center. And part of, part of what's made Methodist Methodist and, and St. Luke's St. Luke's been at Baylor College of Medicine, University of Texas. Fine, fine organizations. They take great pride, in fact, in, in being able to train those people. Well, where do they go? They go into the hinterland, if you will. They go away from Houston to, to practice. In 1969, uh, Lubbock, Texas did its first uh, open heart procedure. 1989, they did their first transplant. And my question is, I think it's great that Lubbock, Texas has the ability to have quality, and they do have quality, cardiovascular treatment programs in, in West Texas. We need them. But there are only 2,000 hearts available nationwide. Uh, unfortunately enough, people haven't signed the back of their driver's license and told their in-laws and outlaws and all those other people that yes, if I'm, you know, uh, in a situation where somebody can use my organs and use them. And the reality is we still only have, and that number, that 2,000 number has been essentially constant for the last five or six or seven years. And so if you only have 2,000 hearts available and you've got probably seven or eight, I don't know exactly, but seven or eight or nine facilities that are doing probably five or six or seven hundred, per, uh, hundred transplants a year, why are you going to go ahead and have, there are a hundred, I think, last, last time I saw the number, 103 hospitals nationwide that said they had a, a heart transplant program. Well, one of them or two of them had, had done one once. Uh, and it comes back, and it comes back to cost, and it comes back to communication, and it comes back to support, uh, you know. And, and I'm not throwing any rocks necessarily at, at the guys in Lubbock, that's fine. But I, I do question, as, as a Texan, why are we going to ultimately support transplant programs in 8 or 10 or 12 different facilities across the state of Texas? My sense is that we could do it very, very well if we focused our efforts as, you know, as Texans in, in two or three or four facilities, and I don't say they all have to come to Houston, but I would think that if you put one, a, a, a good facility in Houston and a good facility in San Antonio and a good facility in Dallas, and maybe a good, a good facility in El Paso, you've touched most of the bases. How is the availability of organs communicated and who's in charge? There is a, a national organ procurement network that um, is all computerized and they simply when a when an organ becomes available uh, they list it and they'll go through and, and every every hospital that's a, a part of this program uh, take the, the Methodist St. Luke's program because effectively it works as a single unit and they do something on the order of uh, 45 to 65 hearts a year uh, and it's a it's a donor related issue more than it is in a, a, cap a capacity issue but they probably have and I again I don't know the numbers for sure but the last time when I was there we had 50 to 70 people on the waiting list at any given time well e everything you ever could want to know about organ uh, uh, compatibility is listed on, on those patients and they're all computerized, and, and uh, the UNOS people, the United Medi uh, Organ Procurement people, have access to that, and they quite simply are going to, if this heart comes available, in your region, they'll go through and say, is there anybody in Houston and Dallas and San Antonio that needs this heart? And if not here, then in expanded areas. And they, so and where it, it becomes available, they work outward. They work from, from their the outside. Uh -huh. Until they get And there. now... Uh, Again, travel being what it is, a heart could be harvested. We had a situation when I was still at the Heart Institute where a little kid was uh, in Idaho. He was four or five years old, and he was swinging in his backyard on a homemade swing, having a good time, and he fell out of the swing, and he landed on a rock on his head. And about four hours later, that heart was in Houston in a, in a little boy. Um, I mean, there was a situation which was terribly traumatic on the one end, but 
you know. But that heart that, made it that from that Idaho. Heart. It didn't go to Seattle uh, or to, uh, San Francisco. Uh, uh, well, and, and it came, it, it, and there again, it was a situation of nationally, where is, you know, where's the best match for a small heart of this type? Now, had the best patient for that heart been in Seattle, it would have gone to Seattle. But you have a situation where there was a need, um, and it's, you know, it, it has to do with age and, and size and all kinds mm -hmm. of, of compatibility issues, but it is communicated nationally. Now, you know, the local guys here, uh, they try to make sure that there's no way they can use their hearts before they let them out. And, and Harris County has the best utilization of available organs of any, any other region in the country. They use about 85% of their own hearts here. Is this internationally um, connected as well, or not really? I don't know. I, I, there's a lot of national and international communication. I don't know the, the details right. of that because uh, a lot of that has to do with, you know, with the, with the regulations from from country to country. I, I simply don't know how that's. Well, and then too, I think you do get into a, a, a organ uh, viability issue of. How long, you know, a lot of times they'll, they'll take a little small, you know, igloo kind of a thing and fill it mm -hmm. full of ice and, and off they go. But that's still, there, there is a finite amount of time that you can transport that, that organ and expect it to, to do well. So I think that if you get into an well, international situation. Well, we talked in one class in here, too, about how hard it is to get a dead body in from a foreign <coughs> country. Yeah, so, it's hard to do. You know. we, we transported, we have a, at the Art Institute, they have a very large uh, a training program and uh, in an educational program, and, and we had a, a gentleman from uh, Czechoslovakia who had been, in, had been there for many, many years, and, and he had trained with one of the premier, um, he's a pathologist, and, and he trained with one of the internationally highly respected uh, pediatric uh, pathologists. And as that individual neared the end of their career, uh, the communication was such that that they would make available to us a number of congenital hearts. And we had a lot of hearts because <coughs> Texas Children's is probably one of the three or four best uh, cardiac, uh, pediatric cardiac programs in the country. And we had a lot of hearts that had been surgically repaired, but we didn't have any native hearts. And this individual said, well, we could have access to and, and transport these hearts and we'd put them here in, as part of our training program and it took some hoops to get mm -hmm. those out of Czechoslovakia and into Houston, Texas. It, it, it took a little bit. Another question. Uh, you mentioned earlier the concept of responsibility. You mm -hmm. say if a person does not smoke or drink or mm -hmm. whatever that, that that would in turn you know benefit or you know lessen their hospital expenses or medical care mm -hmm. is I know the tobacco industry is really taking a beating right but now sure. are are there um, studies or things done to reward people who have who maybe don't you know financially with their insurance premiums if they don't smoke or drink or there are um, I can't I can't give you a specific instance but I I do recall situations where if you don't smoke, and you can validate that that they'll that some insurance companies will reduce your premium slightly. Uh, if you if they insured you and you go through a smoking cessation process and can demonstrate that you've given up smoking, some insurance companies will use that. And unfortunately, I think some of that is more from a from a marketing ploy than it is real live uh, risk. But but that does exist out there. You do begin to see, uh, and and we see more and more of it. Uh, and again, it, it's an educational thing, and it's not nearly as as uh, prolific as it needs to be. But you do begin to see some corporate uh, responsibility. Uh, Tenneco is an excellent example. Uh, Honeywell is another example. Dupont. Some of these companies who begin now to say we believe strongly in work site health promotions, and so we will reward you if you go through smoking cessation or if you do stress management or if you get into weight loss programs and exercise programs because we can tell because we've looked at our own patient population our own employees that if you don't smoke and you don't do these that your absenteeism is, is better 
And if your absenteeism is better, then our production line doesn't go down because you're not there, or whatever that case may be. But they've begun to see and do enough internal studies where they're, they're looking at these kinds of things and beginning to say, it's worth it to us to, to not only finance it, but support it and monetarily cajole or push or whatever you want to say our employees towards better lifestyles. Um, anecdotally, uh, I, I worked for Dr. Cooley for a number of years and I've listened to him give many, many talks and, and he'd go on and on and on about treating patients this way and that way and the other way. And he is a very, very big believer in preventive medicine and the things that you can do and so on. And, and he frequently says, you know, if you need to exercise and you need to eat right and you need to not smoke and you need to do all these things. But the very most important thing you can do to, to ensure long life is pick your parents with great care. Okay. <laughs> so you need to, uh, you know, keep both of those sides uh, Besides the equation go. Yes, ma'am. I have a friend uh, who chooses to go to the emergency room rather than visit her family physician, although she has a very knowledgeable, well-qualified, loving, sweet, great family physician. But um, I'll try not to be too terribly judgmental when I say she'd prefer to live her life in chaos and crisis and complain about her lengthy wait in the emergency room rather than take the time to go to the doctor and, and have him possibly make prior arrangements so that she could be admitted to the hospital because once again she has whatever medical problems she has this week. Does this, surely, I mean, I, she can't this be the only true. person. This is true, I know who she's talking <laughs> yeah, this about. This is a true, <laughs> this is a true story. <laughs> true. This, is, this woman dumps her kids on people, it's just, it's a long, long story. It doesn't even matter about all the, all the incidentals. She, I'm sure she's not the only human being oh, no. who does this, and this must contribute greatly to health care costs for her to consume right. time in the emergency right. room when people who are, in she can just go care. to the doctor and... and right, right. And, and we get into, we talk throughout the course of the evening, we've talked about health care costs and, and access to patients and so on, and, and it is a, a, it's a multi, multi-faceted problem. There aren't any easy answers anymore because there aren't any easy questions. Um, and that's a, that's a major problem. It's, it really is a major problem with um, uh, access. You know, that individual is consuming resources, facility resources and so on, uh, and, and basically cluttering up the emergency room, okay? And where do we... Where do we go as a society? How do we, you know, how do we deal with that? How can you impose? And that's part of the problem, that if you go back to Canada, why does it take so long? Because you've got to deal with that as well, okay? And it just stacks up. Uh, and and any time you get into a nationalized system, you have problems of, of abuse of the system. Um, and we've got to find ways to educate our people and, and get them to become more responsible. Uh, I don't know that it's even related, but it, it makes me think of a situation where uh, you know, Houston is the fourth largest city in the nation, and it leads the nation in the, in the largest port, and it's this, that, and the other thing, you know, tenth in the National League, whatever it is. But unfortunately, one of the things about Houston is that it, it does lead the nation in, in uh, premature, uh, not premature births, but in... Uh, uh, teenage pregnancy. And there again, it's a societal issue and it's an issue of where is the responsibility. You get this kid who physiologically is in the prime of her life to give birth to a child, but there's all the social stigmas of that and the fact that she doesn't want to admit it and she doesn't do for herself prenatally what she ought to do. And so she ends up having a baby and the incidence in, in teenage pregnancy of, of uh, premature births is higher than it is in, in planned parenthood and you get into a situation where that baby then uh, comes you know comes into this world at, at 27 weeks or 29 weeks and now spends the first four months of its life in a neonatal ICU and has a three hundred thousand dollar bill before it can go home okay now you have you have two problems you've got the three hundred thousand dollar bill and who's going to pay for that 
and you have the fact that it's going home, but what's it going home to? Okay, as a society, what are we doing? Does that baby have a clue about what happened to her and uh, not to have that happen again? Uh, and, and how to raise that child? She's 18 years old or she's 16 years old. Uh, my wife had a, has a master's in, in uh, uh, nutrition and did her, her master's degree on uh, uh, this, this particular problem. And, and this has been many, many years ago, but we went to the Harris County people and they gave us all kinds of statistics. And it, it gets your attention when you look at page after page of 16-year-olds having their third child, you know, 18-year-olds having their fifth child. Um, somewhere, we and it comes back to a responsibility issue. Where do we, you know, where do we collectively find ways to get our arms around that so that we don't end up having to support, you know, because it's not only going to impact the hospital stay and that home care issue, but when that child gets to, to school, who's going to ensure that that child has any reason at all to try to, to study the way they ought to study and end up being part of a productive society on the other end? Um, not an easy thing. And, and we come back to your issue a minute ago about a health care crisis, if you will. A lot of the things that are being uh, put into that equation to say that, that the health care industry requires you know, 12 percent of the GNP, they're societal issues. And we come back to Dr. Bernardi, you know, tobacco, health, uh, drugs, and, and alcohol, promiscuity. Think those three through. He, he's hit, you know, hit some points pretty well uh, succinctly to be able to look at those three issues. And you think about the implications of those and the, and the cost of those and the, and the drain on your resources. And, and, you know, you're a citizen of Houston and, and part of what you're paying out every month and bills and, and taxes are going to take care of things that are way beyond the scope of, you know, what you think about. Lara, had a comment and then we'll come back. Parents <coughs> have a responsibility to teach their child, you know, not to use drugs, not to practice promiscuity, but don't you think education, the government has a responsibility? I think they should just cram it down their throats from preschool on, I mean, show them, have teenage moms walk in there and say, I live on three hundred dollars a month, and I, you know, have food stamps. Just to show them how horrible it is, show them the lungs of a smoker and the all the ramifications of that. I think, I mean, I, I think at a very early age, education has a responsibility. The education system has a responsibility just to show them the reality of it, and not let these little fifteen-year-olds have this fairy tale idea. Oh, I'm going to have a baby so I can have someone to love. They need to know the reality of it. Um, let, let me get Nancy yeah. here because she works with some of these yeah. girls. Uh, I, I just work with a lot of them, and I've just written a paper on that, and you know, had some of the latest statistics. And eight out of ten of them, teenagers said they had a lot of sex education, and it was good and helpful, but it didn't stop them from yeah. having the babies. It doesn't teach you self-control, no. right. right? And one of the things, and it's just come out on in the news the this past weekend was that a lot of the mothers are not choosing to give these babies up for adoption and because they are in bad situations they wind up not being able to take care of the babies and the babies majority of these babies and teens are put into foster care and that's the uh, big dilemma in all of this right now is when do you assess that this parent, child, parent may not ever be able to take, take care, care of this baby. baby. And when do we step in as a society and say enough is enough and let it adopt it? I have one question about the health care. Where do you think the concept of living wills would help, you know, in some of the cases where, uh, you know, some choices have to be made at a, a very difficult time to, you know, in health care? Is that something that we should encourage more as our, in our society? I, I think it is because, you know, none of us really wants to focus on the issue of, of the fact that we're all mortal. We're all, so, sooner or later, going to face those, uh, the same you know, ultimate end. And uh, you don't want to focus on that. But if you can, can find a way to be, be able to sit down and think that through, um, what do I want to do? There have been many, many studies done about the, the vast majority of, 
any uh, the total amount of money that you spend on your health care uh, in your entire lifetime, the vast majority of that's spent in the last 30 days of your life. Well, if if you know that your children and your spouse and your loved ones know this is, you know, if I am in such and such a situation, this is how I want to be treated. Okay? None of us want to, to, to let that individual go. And if there's a chance at all that we can do something to sustain that life or give Uncle Ned one more chance, we're going to take that chance. Well, if we know that Uncle Ned has realized that, hey, if, if the only thing that's keeping me alive is a respirator and that's not the way I choose to live, that makes that decision easier. Um, the whole business of hospice care is, is another arena where we're beginning to get our arms around it. Organ donation issues, all of those are all interrelated kinds of issues where we need to make informed decisions. Um, and, and, and as Dr. Hahn said a minute ago, what's the the ten dollar word you used about we all tend to think about what I'm thinking about is the most important thing. Oh, ethnocentrism. Yeah, I love that word. Oh. But I have to write that. Ethnocentrism. Yeah. <laughs> Don't ask me to spell it, please. I'm a terrible speller. But the point is, you could say of, egocentric too. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> that's a close cousin. But but the point is when if that's my uncle Ned, so I'm gonna I'm gonna interpret Uncle Ned's needs through my eyes. Maybe they're Uncle Ned's uh, perspective, or maybe they're not. But I think if we could, could look further at, at uh, uh, living wills and that whole concept of, of what do we do in the time of crisis and make the informed decision and the informed um, choices, we'd all be better sure. Well, I know one elderly gentleman who had a massive heart attack, but they resuscitated him, and his life was terrible for the remaining months and he eventually died of a heart attack and over and over he said to those he knew no, they should have let me die the first time <laughs> and he even told his wife that as she was calling the ambulance you know no no just let me die but that's not the response to someone that you love but he's a, he's a classic case of a person mm -hmm. whose final months were miserable mm -hmm. I got a question, if you don't mind. Okay. Was that Bob back there? No, this is Darren out oh, of Darren. Single Ranch. Okay. Hi, Darren. How you doing? Uh, yeah, I know you mentioned stress management, and I was wondering how, you know, they deal with that within the hospital and what type of support groups or whatever do you have when, you know, I don't want to say call it burnout or whatever, but I can see it being kind of stressful when you're around death and dying all day. It can't be a very fun place to work, and how do they deal with that? Well, they're around a lot of healthy I've been and living a, too. <laughs> read a lot of healthy people, and, and you're really that's a that's a component part of what you do, but it's it's not something you have to deal with. Most people don't have to deal with that every day. Um, you might want to tie into this. We were talking on the break about hate mail and, oh, okay. and rude letters. Okay, you know, we'll, put all that we'll together. We'll try to there. do that. Um, the stress management programs are. Uh, there's usually a, a, a curriculum to them, and whether they're they're done usually in the workplace, uh, stress whether it's the stress of somebody dying or the stress of of deadlines and term papers and final exams or whatever. I mean, stress is still stress, and how you deal with it is 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 pretty much. I think the process is very much the same. Um, there are specific people in in healthcare, you know, in, in acute care hospitals that do see a lot more, as you put it, death and dying than than the rest of us do. Um, in case in point, the people that deal we, we've talked a little bit about organ procurement and transplantation. People that deal in a transplant service and a heart transplant service quite frequently are going to burn out after, you know. A, a period of time because of the simply because of the stress and the fact that you embrace that individual and that individual's family at all levels and and ultimately that individual dies and, and you simply can't do it there are some people who have the psychological ma uh, makeup to be able to basically build a wall it's not to say that they don't care it's not to say that they're not providing that support 
but they've been able to insulate themselves such that it simply doesn't finally get to them like it, like it does most people. Uh, interestingly enough, when I did my residency at, uh, in hospital administration, uh, the uh, guy that was over my whole program said to me one day, he said, well, he says, one thing you need to kind of think about, he says, the head of your uh, dietary program, he said, just if you ever have your own hospital, he said, plan on replacing that guy about every seven years. And I said, what do you mean? Of all the things there are, he said, no. He said, think about it. He's got special diets. He's got special events. He's got three <laughs> meals a day. He's got to get all those meals up on all those floors. And the only feedback he ever gets is that he got a salt diet when he was supposed to not get a salt diet, or it was hot when it was supposed to be cold. And he says, that's the most stressful job in the and building. And there was no watermelon on July the 4th. That's right. <laughs> I know somebody and, 15 years ago hadn't know, gotten over that yet. And so that's it. And I'm not, you know, and I'm not coming back to this hospital because the food is lousy. He said that's the, the, the highest stress job in the entire building. But <clears throat> Dr. Hunt asked me to, to relate a, a, another communication issue about mail and hate mail and what to do. Um, we had a situation again at the Heart Institute where we take care of, uh, not, not me anymore because I'm not there, but they take care of a lot of um, extremely, extremely ill patients whose, whose options are really very limited. And especially in a pediatric situation, you really try to do all you can do. But you have to be very honest and very frank with parents. And on a number of occasions, we've had situations where the patient usually comes, comes here from someplace else um, and, and has been turned down by one or two or three other facilities. And sometimes we turn them down as well and say, I'm sorry, we just simply can't do anything for this child. But sometimes we'll say, well, we, you need to understand that, that the, you know, the risks involved with this are very, very <clears throat> great and the chances of a long-term positive outcome are not good and go through that in, in very detailed ways so that that individual tries to make as informed a decision as you can in that extremely em emotional situation. But we had a situation one time where that was the case and, and a young man in fact had surgery and in fact uh, unfortunately died and the father um, he didn't handle that well at all, uh, not at all. And, and so finally he said a lot of things that he shouldn't have said and it was a very unpleasant experience for everybody involved in it. But finally he left and um, we would get strange letters. Um, directed towards the practice and, and, the, and the physicians involved with that care and they'd be little cards like you know we hope you have a great day today Billy will never have another great day he's dead you killed him um, you know today was Billy's 14th birthday but really he'll never have another birthday on and on and on and it got very very uh, over the course of, of a fairly short period of time it got increasingly more frequent and, and more intent and, and then finally he wrote a letter that implied that he intended to do bodily harm to uh, some of our physicians and at that point we called security who they're kind of like on airplanes you don't joke about having a gun well you don't joke about that sort of thing to the hospital and they took it extremely seriously and uh, HPD got involved immediately and they did uh, the individual at this time had moved out of the city and was back in the city they found where he was they 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 literally put a tail on the guy for uh, two or three or four days they posted his picture around different places in the hospital and again it was a communication issue if you know if the, the volunteers working on the front desks if you see this guy pick up the phone and call security so on and so forth um, and they volunteered to have, you know, escorts and, and security people with the physicians involved. And so 
because it was a very, very serious case where basically he threatened the man's life. Um, in this case, the, the individual uh, moved to New York and, and after a period of time we never heard any more from him at all and, and so on. But, but you do get those kinds of situations where, um, uh, and again, it, it's, it's a communication thing where you've got to know what you're doing and you've got to know where to turn and what to do. Um, if, in fact, this individual were to come on the premises of the hospital, he doesn't have a patient here. He doesn't have a reason. And, then, you know, the security people are very, very sensitive to the fact that he's, he's here for reasons other than to look in on a sick friend. Yes, ma'am. Oh. Oh. oh, we're running out of time. Is that what that signal is? <laughs> okay, well, we'll just pause there Real then. Uh, I certainly want to express our appreciation to you. Thank you. Uh, Chuck Edmonds obviously has a lot of experience in this area, and I think you can tell from his comments tonight that uh, he's a concerned as well as informed uh, person, and we appreciate your taking this time and spending that, this amount of time with us. Uh, I want to thank this class this semester. This is the last class, and I think the staff as well as the students is, are a bit relieved at that. At the same time, I'm going to miss you. Uh, but this has been an experiment with uh, a communication class, and uh, so we're, we're pleased to have taken care of that. The, you have take-home exams. Remind you of those, and, and on the exam are the dates that those are due in. Uh, several people uh, in class as well as in the studio class as well as home viewers have asked about the length of the responses to those. Um, I guess a ballpark notion is two pages per question double spaced. But I'm interested in good balanced answers. You can tell from the assortment of questions that I want to be sure that you've either attended or viewed the tapes for all of the classes. So what I'll be looking for in the answers is a response that shows me you've listened to the whole tape, <laughs> that you've absorbed uh, the whole tape, or at least you know reasonable portions thereof across the board, uh, that, that you have assimilated material from the course throughout the semester. So, you know, don't give me an answer that comes out of the first 15 minutes of the tape, or uh, if you're doing the bonus question on tonight's class, don't give us the last 15 minutes of uh, what Mr. Edmonds had to say and uh, skip all the other part, because we are looking for that balance. I hope that as a result of this semester, you are able to go back and more easily assess situations, even as you read newspapers. And, and look at different articles or hear items on the news, you should instinctively be uh, cognitively responding, you know, is this an urgent situation? Was this an emergency? If I had been on the scene, what would I have done? Uh, hopefully you just get these cognitive experiences uh, rather than actually being a few blocks away when a building is blown up or in five cars back when there's a a major collision or something. Those moments will come, for some of us at least. But being able to look at that and say, is this a crisis situation? Is this an emergency? Uh, what kind of a situation am I dealing with here? And then subsequently looking at that and saying, and, and automatically uh, going back to that plan that we set up in the beginning of the semester of saying we want to clarify what kind of crisis it is, and then we want to work at stabilizing the situation, whether this is a major medical emergency or whether this is a person who's having an existential crisis or if this is just a routine adolescent situational crisis. You know, where are we in this, but what do we need to do in order to stabilize that situation? and then what kind of an action plan can be put into place. And as we've heard this evening uh, through this class, when it's a very complicated uh, medical situation or when it's a major uh, community disaster of some sort, 
we have a, you know, fortunately there are people who've planned ahead who have major plans in place. But that same kind of wisdom should prevail as we find ourselves in interpersonal or small group uh, limited crises. So, thank you very much. Turn those papers in. <laughs>